you hear what I was playing, Lane? I did not think it polite to listen. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. Ah, I see you've got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell. Who can that be so early? Mr. Ernest Worthings. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. Meeting as usual, I see, Algy. I believe it is customary, good society, to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Who's coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. The way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up expressly to propose to her. I thought you would come up for pleasure. I call that business. <coughs> Please. Please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. You've been eating them all the time. That is quite different. She is my aunt. <coughs> Besides, I have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. And what very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, my dear fellow, you need not eat as if you were already married to her. You are not married to her, and I don't think you ever will be. Why do you say that? In the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of Cecily. Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. This is the cigarette case you left last time you dined here. But when I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. You said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you must know, Cecily's my aunt. But why does your aunt call you, call herself Little Cecily? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. <laughs> well, my dear fellow, some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. Surely that is a matter an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. For heaven's sakes, give me back my cigarette case. But that, but why does your small aunt Cecily call you her dear uncle? From little Cecily with a fondest love to her dear uncle Jack. Besides, your name isn't Jack, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's Jack. You have always said it was Ernest. You answered the name of Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I ever saw. It's already a card. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, the Albany. I'll keep this as proof that your name is Ernest. <laughs> <laughs> Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me as a young boy, um, made me, in his will, guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who resides at my place in the country, uh, who addresses me as her uncle, under her admirable, admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You will not be invited. But why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, when one, is placed in the when one is placed in the position of guardian, he has to uphold a very high moral tone. And as a high moral tone is not conducive to one's health or one's happiness, I have created a very useful younger brother who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful of scrapes. That, my dear friend, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. What you really are is a bunburyist. You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight. I have a dice to you to dine. I know. You are absurdly careless about sending out invitations. <laughs> Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunbury. Bunbury? What on earth do you mean by Bunbury? I'll reveal to you the meaning of the question of the incomparable expression as soon as you inform me why you are earnest in town and jack in the country. My dear fellow, as I previously stated, I was placed in the position of guardian. I must upheld my high moral tone, and as that is not fun or healthy, I have invented my uh, younger brother, who I pretend to be when I come up to town. Therefore, I can come whenever I would like. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you may have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight? Of course. <laughs> Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling 
doing very well, Aunt Augusta. That is not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I'm more smart, am I not, Mr. Worthy? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. I am sorry if we are late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Highbury. I hadn't been there since the poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so often. She looks quite 20 years younger. Now, I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Good heavens, Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? There are no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even ready for a rainy morning. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbour, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold for, for grief. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, for I have just had a telegram to say that poor Bunbury is very ill again. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I think it is high time that Mr. Bunbury make up his mind whether he's going to live or die. This shilly shine for question is absurd. I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for my last reception. Oh, yes. We'll run over the program now. If you'll kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Archibald. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Charming day to spend Miss Fairfax. Pray, don't talk about the weather, Mr. Barthing. Whenever people talk about the weather, I always feel certain that they mean something else. Uh, I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any other person I've ever met since I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite well aware of the fact, Mr. Worthing. For me, you've always had an irresistible fascination. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals, and my ideal has always been to love someone with the name of Ernest. The moment Algernon first mentioned he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You mean you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest? Ernest is a splendid name. It produces vibrations. I can think of lots of nicer names. Jack, for instance, is a charming name. <laughs> Jack? It produces no vibrations. No, the only safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I, I mean, <laughs> we must get married at once. Married? But you haven't even proposed to me yet. And I think it on, only fair to warn you beforehand that I'm determined to accept. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you've been about it. This is a word. Buy yourself from the semi recumbent party that is most indecorous. Mama, Mr. Worthing is not quite finished. Finished what, may I ask? Mr. Worthing and I are engaged, Mama. I beg your pardon, but you are not engaged to anyone. When you do the convention, I will inform you. Now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. When I am making these inquiries, you both will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Wendell. Wendell! Carriage! Yes, Mama. <laughs> Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. Do you smoke? Yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation. Are your parents living? No, I'm afraid I've lost both my parents. <laughs> to lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who is your father? <laughs> I'm afraid I really don't know. It would have been near to the truth to say my parents lost me. I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, a man of a very cheerful disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket to the place in his pocket. Worthing is a place in Sussex, a uh, seaside resort. And oh, why did this cheerful gentleman with a first-class ticket to the seaside resort find you? A handbag. A handbag? Yes, a brown leather handbag with handles to it. Quite an ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? The cloakroom at Victoria Station. The cloak at Victoria Station? Yes, the Bryson line. The line is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. I must confess I'm bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for common decency. May I ask what you advise me to do? I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try to acquire some relations. I can produce the handbag at any moment. Mr. Worthing, <laughs> you can hardly imagine that I would allow my only daughter to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with Parson. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. Bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 bum,
Um, stop pumping that ghastly tune out. You. you don't mean to. It didn't go off all right, little boy. You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you. Well, Gwendolyn is right, it's a trip. But her mother is perfectly unbearable. Did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? By the end of the week, I will have got rid of my mother. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Apoplexy is hereditary. You'd much better say a severe chill. All right then, my peer, poor brother Ernest is carried off suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of me. But I thought you said that Miss Cardi was a little too interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Cecily is not a silly romantic girl. She has a capital appetite, takes long walks, and pays no attention at all to her studies. I would rather like to see Cecily. I would take very good care. You never do. <coughs> Miss Fairfax. Aldi, kindly you turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Barley. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on my mom's face, I fear we never shall. But although I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing can alter my eternal devotion to you. Your town address in Albany, I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. I will communicate with you daily. Aldi, you may turn it on now. You may also ring the bell. You will let me see you to your carriage. I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going to Bunbury. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can pack all the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. Hard 
political economy, hard geography, hard German. Mr. Ernest Worthings has just driven over from the station. Here's breakfast, let me tweet. Mr. Ernest Worthing, the Albany. Uncle Jack's brother. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. Yes, miss. I've never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so scared he will look just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I am for all the trouble I have given you, and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to refuse your brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. Oh, Uncle Jack, there is some good in everyone. Ernest here has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury. Bunbury? I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or anything else for that matter. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. <laughs> All right, but this will be the last time I shall do it. Good is it not to see such perfect reconciliation? I think we might leave the two brothers together. Yes, Cecily, you will come with us. You've done a great action today, dear child. I feel very happy. Algy, you young scoundrel, you must leave this place at once. I've put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to you, sir. What? I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. <laughs> Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Yes. Mr. Ernest has suddenly been called back to town. 
But I fear for Lyra you are, Jack. No one has called me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. Cecily is a darling. I will not have you talk about Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous. <laughs> it's perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying a whole week with you. You are certainly not staying a whole week with me. I certainly won't leave you so long as you're in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. <laughs> well, if I change my clothes, will you leave? Yes, if you're not too long about it. I never saw anybody take so long to dress with such little results. <laughs> <laughs> this bunburying, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. Personification of absolute perfection. Thank you. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. <laughs> Please, Ernest, do not stop. I delight in taking down dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. <clears throat> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. <laughs> Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I've dared to love you wildly. Will you marry me? You silly boy, of course. We've been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? <laughs> yes. Ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to me that he had a younger brother who was very wicked, I fell in love with you. Besides, there's a matter of your name. You mustn't laugh at me, but it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ed. You mean you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. <laughs> I might respect you. I might admire your character, but I fear I shall not be able to give you my undivided attention. <clears throat> Besides, Ernest is your name. <clears throat> your record here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of all rites of the church. Oh, yes. Dr. Chesterfield has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on the most important Christmas. I mean, on most important business. I shan't be away more than half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I shall copy his remarks into my diary. <laughs> uh, Miss Fairfax has just called to see a Mr. Worthy. Please, ask the lady to come here and you can bring some tea. Yes, miss. Mrs. Fairfax, I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack and his philanthropic work in London. Mrs. Fairfax. Please, let me introduce myself. My name is Cecily Carter. Cecily Carter, what a very sweet name. I like you already, and my first impressions are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much. Please, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. But that is all quite so, is it not? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> my mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. So do you mind my looking at you through my glasses? Not at all. I'm very fond of being looked at. <laughs> <laughs> you are here on short visit, I suppose. Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother. No, in fact, any relations. You see, my dear guardian, with the obvious task of Miss Prism, has the rightful way of looking after me. I must never mention to me he had a war. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but is it not? It is not Ernest who is my guardian. It is his brother. Ernest never mentioned to me he had a brother. You are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest's brother who is your brother. Quite sure, and that I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Mr. Worthing and I are engaged to be married. I feel there must be some slight error. Mr. Worthing is engaged to me. I feel you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. <laughs> that is very curious, for he proposed to me yesterday afternoon at 5.30. I must 
I do not know if there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air on this particular part of Bedfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average. <laughs> I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? <laughs> Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the old Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square. That sounds not unsatisfactory. I also have certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, vaccination, registration, <laughs> whooping cough, the measles, uh, the measles, both the German and English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incidents. Has Miss Cardew any little fortune? About 130,000 funds. Um, ah, my bad. About 130,000 pounds in the funds. <laughs> Miss Cardew seems to be a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Oh, yeah, dear. that you propose is quite out of the question. On what grounds do you object? Well, I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and as such, I do not give my consent. But the matter is entirely up to you. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will allow an alliance between your nephew and my lord. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Army, the general's army list of the period. 
these wonderful books, which should have been my constant study. M. Generals, uh, Malum, Moxbone, Male. What ghastly names these men have. <laughs> ah, yes, here we are. Lieutenant, 1840. Captain, Lieutenant, Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869. Christian names, Ernest John. Gwendolyn, I've always told you my name was Ernest, and it is. It naturally is Ernest. I felt from the first you could have no other name. Lydia! Fudge, it got lost. Cecily at last. Gwendolyn at last. You seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I have for the first time in my life realized the vital importance of being Ernest. <laughs> Benjamin, the director needs to come take a bow. Benjamin, come take a bow.